There we go. All right. So my name is Daniel Unger. I'm the Vice President of Guest Experience and Education here at the Gardens. Before we begin, the first thing I want to do this afternoon is recognize Ina and Louis Hayfitz. They're right up here in the front. They have endowed this lecture series. We are 12 years in with this lecture series. And as you all know, we are not an old organization. So really to have had this lecture series from our beginnings has allowed us to have many speakers at the forefront of horticulture and conservation here at the gardens. And of course, allowed us to have this event today. So I really wanna thank you, Ina and Lou for establishing this series. So I have, I have two duties uh, before you this afternoon. The first is welcoming you all here. And then the second is welcoming our speaker, Dr. Darren Renko. So before I introduce Dr. Renko, I wanna welcome you all to this place. We are gathered in what we all know, I think, is a beautiful place. This is a beautiful building, the Bosarge Family Education Center, the second public building to be built on our campus, was built as a model of sustainability and it's been the home for thousands of students over the short period that it's been open. And it's our beautiful botanical gardens, 325 acres of wild and cultivated lands, a place that continually inspires and makes meaningful connections for all our visitors between themselves and the natural world. It's a place that oftentimes is a place of peace or respite, or for others, it's a place that inspires action and renewal. And we're part of this broader, beautiful landscape, this web of tidal rivers and ponds, peninsulas and islands, and we're surrounded by the thriving sea life and the spruce fir hemlocks and the wetlands that feed these soils and estuaries. It's a beautiful place. It's also since time immemorial, this place has been the traditional homeland of the Wabanaki people, the Wabanak and the Penobscot. This network of bays, rivers and shorelines was home to many deeply rooted indigenous communities. Many species that we now hardly see, or in some cases, they're the, at the forefront of conservation efforts to revive species like alewives and Atlantic salmon, were integral to Wabanaki lifeways, part of a culture that has been handed down to the present day. So as part of welcoming you and coming together in this beautiful place, I wanna express our gratitude for those thousands of years of stewardship, and also recognize that the lands we now occupy were never ceded. Further, I just want to take a moment to recognize that the dispossession of land from the Wabanaki people, part of a history, a history of purposeful policies and practices which continue to the present day. They're expressed as treaty rights that continue to be broken, the continual lack of recognition of the sovereignty of Wabanaki nations, including the Penobscot, the Pathmaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet. Acknowledging this is a small step in a longer process, here at the gardens, we've been taking steps with our staff and board to learn more about how we might change our part in this history. And we invite you to be part of that. For today, I wanna to call out the past, the present and the future of this beautiful place so that we all might think about how they might be linked. Today, when you walk through this place and you have just a snapshot in time, you don't get a sense of the history and you might not get any sense of a cause for concern. We walk through our woods, they look timeless and unchanging. But in fact, this landscape looked vastly different even a hundred years ago. Today, a changing climate is altering our landscape too. Below the surface, we've had a persistent drought. Those of you that live nearby are aware that has been challenging our cultivated gardens and it's been affecting the insect life our gardens support. In our forest, we now have multiple invasive species that threaten the trees in our forest and the life that depends on them. So part of what we're here to do today is that if we wanna find new paths forward through what it means to inhabit this beautiful place, we must broaden both the way we reflect on our past and the way we envision our future. That's why it's really a privilege and an honor for me to introduce Dr. Renko. So Dr. Darren Renko is chair of Native American programs and coordinator of Native American research at the University of Maine. A citizen of the Penobscot Nation, Dr. Renko studies the ways that indigenous communities resist environmental destruction 
their use of indigenous knowledge systems, as well as how state systems continue to expose indigenous people to environmental harm. Since 2009, Dr. Renko has led the Emerald Ash Borer Task Force. It's a team of researchers, policymakers, and basket makers to address the threat posed by the invasive emerald ash borer beetle. Emphasizing Wabanaki ecological knowledge and diplomacy, the task force has been responsible for establishing a vibrant educational network throughout the state. And it's just one example of how Dr. Renko has led multiple innovative collaborations focused on how better research relationships can be made between universities, native and non-native researchers, and indigenous communities to better address the environmental threats that we all collectively face. His collaborative work is helping set forth new strategies that are informing public policy and establishing new methods of bringing together diverse groups to address environmental issues. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Darren Renko. Um, and extra special thanks to the Hafitz family for their continued support for this uh, lecture series. And um, I'm really just floored by to be here. The um, I'll just go into what my goals for today are. Obviously, I want to explore, as um, Daniel mentioned, my work is a it's critically about collaboration, but really centering indigenous people's knowledge um, and, and our livelihoods. Um, so I wanna explore the opportunities for indigenous led conservation and what is now called Maine. Um, to do that, I have to, you know, I'm a scholar, so I'm gonna define things and talk about other people's scholarship, but I hopefully that will help us understand sort of where the, um, where this work is going here in Maine, and it's actually going in really interesting and in amazing directions. And um, I, I see Carol Wishcamper has, has helped us with uh, uh, a fair amount of this work, and, and I just want to thank her again for her continued support. Um, you know, I'll, I'll name drop any, anyone else I see as well. Um, I, I do want to talk about this emergent scholarship uh, that shows how indigenous centered and indigenous led conservation and land protection work is the best around the globe. Uh, and I think we're we're really pursuing that here in, 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 in Maine as well. And then I'll think about some best practices for establishing this um, work um, uh, to feature Wabanaki um, people. Of course, this is all familiar to you where our tribes are. Um, this is, you know, my old slide, the, the uh, Rustic Band of Micmacs changed their name to the Micmac Nation about six months ago. So obviously this is a, not a new slide. Um, even more complicated than that is of course, um, where our lands are currently as, uh, as, as the tribes. And you can see this mixture of things. And this is part of the legacy of the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act from 1980, as well as our retained lands um, through all the times that uh, a variety of, pe of people and groups uh, tried to take our lands through various uh, nefarious and illegal means. Um, and then uh, for us as Wabanaki people, how we think about our territory, um, the state of Maine is not a, a key part of that. We think of this region as to Wabanaki, you know, the greater Wabanaki territory where we, um, where we call our home, but the intimate relationships with, with each other as Wabanaki people, as well as the, the plants, animals, species, all the things that kind of make this territory um, what it is, is we see it across this broader landscape of Northern New England, I guess, and Eastern Canada. So one of the things I wanna think about in terms of our work um, is that this is a map of, of currently uh, conserved uh, places or parklands in, in Maine. Um, it, it roughly encompasses about a third of the territory of Maine. And um, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing to think with um, as we pursue collaborations with land trusts and conservation groups as Wabanaki people, sort of how to think about our collective responsibilities to these places, ones that are already protected in some fashion um, and to think about that uh, uh, um, more seriously as a Wabanaki um, endeavor and as, as serving uh, Wabanaki cultural uh, preferences. 
Um, it's not dissimilar to, uh, and this is a map of the lands that were uh, illegally taken by treaties after 1790 and formed the, 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 the legal uh, framework for the Maine Indian Claim Settlement Act in 1980. But as you see, all the shaded areas are this broad two thirds of the state of Maine. Can you, oh, you can't really see it. Sorry, yeah, see that, see, you guys wanted to see my face. You can't see my face and this, uh, this map, but hey, uh, central and northern and eastern Maine were, were the two thirds of the state of Maine that were um, um, treaties signed with the state of Massachusetts and then the state of Maine uh, after 1790, which broke federal law, the, the Federal Non-Intercourse Act. And it, that, that was served as the basis of the Settlement Act in 1980. So uh, part of my point is that there's a kind of mapping between this and, and where these lands are and sort of how we think of ourselves in relation to place as well, but not be people. Okay, some definitions. A lot of what our, um, and this is like a, my slides are <laughs> Mac slides that aren't exactly translating well to this PC device. You know, a lot of people don't like Bill Gates right now. Me, me not because of his work on vaccines though, just because of this. Um, the, the notion of land back is a, is a broad political movement um, by indigenous people. It's, it's international in its ori origin and it's, it's purposely political and anti-colonial. And it's about the return of everything taken from us as indigenous peoples through colonization. So not only land, our language, our kinship systems, our governance systems, all of these things. Um, and so it, 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 it speaks to this really important kind of political moment that we're in. And we think about the relations with conservation or any of the kind of land movements. Um, land back is, is the primary political frame. It also intersects with a number of issues around climate justice um, world, worldwide that indigenous people are taking up and being the real center of in terms of uh, management um, and, and decision-making around um, natural systems. Rematriation is something that is um, more of a cultural movement. It emphasizes our traditions related to, to women, tradition, um, food sovereignty. Uh, those kinds of elements are part of the rematriation and, and even more so than land back, emphasizes uh, the right relationships uh, between humans and non-humans. And it emphasizes, it de-emphasizes the legacies of property systems that sort of define our land-based uh, uh, engagements, even for, for, for land trusts and conservation groups, and really centers uh, tradition and the intimate relations between humans and non-humans and making those right uh, once again. So I think some of you know the work of Sherry Mitchell. Um, she is one of the people I turn to when I think about um, the traditions of women and two-spirit people as it relates to um, what we're talking about with rematriation. Um, and she says that Wabanaki women are once again at the center of our communities in this work. Um, they're leading this work to recover our traditional ways of knowing and being through language programs, renewal of kinship networks, revitalization of land-based teachings, and these focus on the relationship between all systems within creation. The women are also decolonizing our stories developing pathways for food sovereignty, protecting our lands and waters. And I think um, this is politics in a slightly different um, frame, a slightly different uh, emphasis, but I would say, and I credit Wabanaki women with the shift that has happened within the state of Maine in the possibilities of political relationship building and allyship. Uh, I see that going back to the uh, uh, to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on child welfare issues, and even a little bit before that. And it, it has been Wabanaki women that have thought through and reframed the possibilities of the political in the state. So other key frames, um, Wabanaki diplomacy and indigenous science. And I, and I would 
I would have gladly had uh, been in all four of these pictures. I'm only in the top two, but you can tell I also go out and look at trees in the top left in, in addition to my normal like, hey, let's hang out in a conference room and chat about things. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, um, we've been working on uh, uh, protecting basket trees, the brown ash, black ash trees um, across uh, the region. Um, which is threatened by the invasive emerald ash borer. And we started this work fairly early on, um, engaging with basket makers, but also traveling out to places like New York and Michigan, where the EAB was already present in, um, in 2010, 2011, and really having our basket makers see what happens to trees and be on the lookout for that, as well as um, work with state and federal forestry um, policymakers to really include uh, Wabanaki voices in the response uh, to the EAB here in, in, our, in, in Maine. So during this work, we found two really important concepts that, that carry us to the, the contemporary work around um, um, land return rematriation. The first is the centering of indigenous science. Um, this obviously thinks of our, us as indigenous people as the core knowledge holders around um, particular places, um, but it also incorporates things not seen in Western science. So um, a set of values and responsibility to place um, that you know, our teachings are to learn the thing, to learn about the thing, you are responsible for it. I don't see that in forestry classes, although maybe in the economic interests, they, they see you feel responsible. Sorry, uh, academic forestry is still tied to like growing trees really fast. Anyway, anyway, I digress. So, but really in, uh, centering indigenous um, knowledge systems and the fact that it is hundreds, if not thousands of years old, I like to think about our oral traditions as a kind of peer review, which is the highest standard of academic knowledge is when your peers review it. We have knowledge systems that have been peer reviewed over multiple generations rooted in these specific places. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, if you talk to most forestry people about what is a basket quality brown or black ash, first of all, they probably don't know how to identify a brown or black or ash tree. Most foresters don't. It's a, considered a weed species as a, as a hardwood. Um, and then what would, it what would it take to create a basket quality ash? We've been thinking about that for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Right. So thinking about the conditions to to that is is what I'm talking about and then the responsibility to it. Right. How do we manage for and protect its interests? The other uh, thing that we've been centering is Wabanaki diplomacy. And like any cultural forms of diplomacy, it, it reflects political engagements. Uh, it reflects a lot of different kind of protocols for us as indigenous people again, rooted in this place. But um, since even before the arrival of Europeans, we've had relationships, treaty relationships, um, formal agreements, often preserved in wampum belt traditions and other mnemonic devices that have set out protocols as how to solve problems that impact us all across multiple tribal nations, human and non-human communities. So we'd really mobilize a decision-making process and framework that is inclusive of humans, indigenous and non-indigenous, non-humans, and to really incorporate that into a process of knowledge mobilization and responsibility. And that's been the core of um, our work around the process. All right. Any, I, I'm not gonna open up to questions. I can see you guys are itching. Like, what about that? Okay. This is my the part of the talk where I I talk about other people's scholarship, um, and it's really in mobilizing these key frames, especially indigenous science and knowledge and and diplomacy, Wabanaki diplomacy. A key part of that is to say, what role for indigenous people in the protection of places? Where where has it been, and where where can it be? Uh, for me. Uh, the, the academic and political discussion starts primarily, I mean, it starts before this, but it starts in earnest in, in sort of contemporary policymaking spaces with this report 
from the World Bank in 2008. Many of you might know that these statistics are mobilized all the time for various, various ways and various reasons. It's the idea that we as Indigenous people make up just 4% of the global population and that we occupy and have some control over 22% of the world's land surface area. And on that right land surface area is 80% of the planet's biodiversity, right? So this has been, this, this research um, has been challenged from all sorts of different directions. Oftentimes you can make an argument for different kinds of percentages, but the fact remains and the causes of it, oh, it's because, you know, people forgot about those places where, you know, like you can think about any number of ways to critique it. But since this report, we've been working on figuring out what role, what important role indigenous people have in the protection of places. And this has become obviously with the climate crisis, even more important in how we formulate a response to it. I've been lucky enough to be involved in some of these discussions. This is a paper um, published in 2021, last year, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's a high impact journal. So yeah, that's right, high impact. Um, and I am, you know, whatever, eighth author out of 14. Um, this is uh, the contemplation of really shifting the narrative around what is our role as humans and are humans positive or negative impacts on our environments, our biodiversity? Is being human mean that we are fated to destroy our planet? This research says no. That's, that's my summary of it. No, so the, the idea is we looked at 12,000 years of human impacted landscape and lands. Um, and by and large, until the last three or 400 years, almost universally, humans have been a net benefit to biodiversity, right? Um, and this is even with fairly large scale agricultural systems, things that, you know, I was in a debate in the late 90s about are Indians ecologists and, you know, the anthropologists, other anthropologists, I, I don't identify as an anthropologist always because they, they don't like me. Um, they, uh, they're like, what about the overhunting of whatever the species? And then being species specific, of course, yeah, that can be <laughs> people, people have had negative impacts over time. But biodiversity, ecological um, health, right? That's a more important measurement of how we as humans are impacting our environments. And what we saw in this paper, this is mobilizing new sort of models, new, more sensitive ways of studying over time um, impacts of, of people on lands. Um, that we see the current biodiversity losses are caused not by human conversion or degradation of untouched ecosystems, but by the appropriation, colonization, and intensification of use in lands previously inhabited and used by prior societies, i.e., indigenous people. Right? So this, we are not fated as humans to destroying our planet. I guess that's the most positive message I can have for you today. But we have to change things, obviously, and talk more about that. More, more papers um, here. This is about studying basically outcomes from well-being and conservation where indigenous peoples and local communities play a central role in decision-making. Again, this is just one of a dozen papers. And I don't even know why I chose this one. I'm sure when I was putting this together, I had a reason. Um, that is really about um, indigenous people having substantial influence or decision-making and uh, or when local institutions regulating tenure uh, a property form a recognized part of governance. So this idea of indigenous authority in decision making, having this net um, positive difference on on conservation uh, outcomes. Similarly, we have a paper about the uh, resurgence of indigenous governance systems as being a, a possibility for increased conservation effectiveness. All right, I'll just keep you guys really 
I know you love these papers, right? So I excluded two or three of them, but I have them at the end of the slides if you want me to discuss other papers. Anyway, so what are the Wabanaki possibilities? Many of you, I think, are aware, some of you pretty well, are aware of this thing called the First Light Learning Journey. Um, and that was started in, uh, by land trusts and conservation groups across the state of Maine, um, 2017, 2018, um, with a number of us who are indigenous educators, political leaders, and sort of saying, really coming, I mean, this is, this is truly amazing work. And you know, I can thank any number of people um, Peter Forbes is probably the, the individual that kind of coalesced around this, but there's a whole host of folks at the Nature Conservancy and the Maine Coast Heritage Trust and a bunch of other groups that have really been forward, just amazingly forward thinking about, and they are in some ways responding not only to the scholarship that I just referenced, but about an ethical and moral responsibility to Indigenous people in this space. So they are saying, okay, we're land trusts, we're conservation groups. How can we be more centered around Wabanaki people experience, um, create more um, sustainable partnerships? Um, and really for First Light, the goal is restoring, um, as they mentioned in the documents, Wabanaki true prosperity through an intentional sustained effort to expand Wabanaki stewardship of land. And this is done through direct collaboration. This, this first light learning journey, this first light group being formed first with just five conservation, six conservation groups, and then in a subsequent year, uh, expanding it to 25 and 30, um, really has made this impact and created all sorts of opportunities that um, as the tribes witnessed these efforts, it forced us to come to the table with how do we meet this challenge and really direct this work as, as Wabanaki people. And in so doing, we created the Wabanaki Commission on Land and Stewardship. The, the, the commission is, um, um, has representation uh, by two selected individuals by the tribal governments from each of the five tribal governments. So it is, purposely appointed and directed by the tribal governments uh, across what is now Maine. Um, and its mission is really to improve broadly the health and well-being of our people, to expand our access, management, ownership of lands, to practice our land-based cultures across Wabanaki homeland, what is now the state of Maine. This includes acquiring lands, sharing and co-managing, um, working with currently owned land by land trusts and conservation organizations um, is really this an attempt to create a deep partnership and direct the work and be in, um, be in relation um, with one another and uh, the, our non-human uh, relations. So, so far, and I'll talk about a couple of these uh, instances, the Wabanaki Commission on Land and Stewardship has resulted in um, over 1,500 acres of land returned. That doesn't sound like a lot. There's a lot more that is potential here, but many more acres that, that can and will be returned. Um, but also in, uh, beyond that is it's created Wabanaki access to several thousand acres of conservation land trust land for gathering key species, including brown black ash, um, to refer to as the, the basket tree. Um, we're working on uh, access to sweet grass harvesting areas, um, harvesting, uh, and where this is happening just tomorrow, um, thinking about harvesting our uh, traditional clay and, and pottery practices, mobilizing this as a tradition. Um, and often when we go into forests where land trusts will be like, oh, there's um, um, there's a, well, we think that's a brown ash tree. And they're like, oh yeah, that, that is, but it's not basket quality. Sometimes we go into the woods and we'll see like, hey, there's actually some really good birch in here. So um, we're still working on sort of like the permit and access point for um, really amazing birch to build um, wigwams, to build uh, birch bark canoes, that sort of thing. And then there's this sort of, 
deep possibility for cultural use agreements where there's a deeper recognition beyond sort of permits and access points where land trusts and Wabanaki people come together to co-manage um, in a culturally significant way um, lands and steward lands. And that's getting us towards the kind of best practices. In fall of 2020, um, um, Elliotsville, um, and I'm sorry, they, they, they've changed their name a couple of times. Uh, Elliotsville, Carol, Elliotsville <laughs> Foundation now, sorry. Elliotsville Foundation um, donated 735 acres to the Penobscot Nation. It actually allowed us to connect two pieces of our lands as Penobscot Nation. Um, and it is sort of the legacy, of course, of the Quimby land holdings in, in and around the Baxter region. Um, it, had, it had been a long time in coming, and I think really seizing the sort of the, the moment around the first light and the Wabanaki Commission um, made the Elliottsville the first significant donation that that this part these partnerships had had um, created, but it also uh, paved the way for for many others. Um, and one that is really um, proved to be significant is the return of Pine Island in the spring of 2021. Although there was just a celebration because of the pandemic and a bunch of things that happened. Um, um, just at the uh, summer solstice, um, and that this celebration was a celebration of returning a relation back to the Passamaquoddy community. Um, and Pine Island um, has a significant cultural past. It's also implicated in some of the illegal treaties and sort of how, how that went down. Uh, so it, it really has um, created this pathway for healing and, 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 and the return, um, you know, as, as uh, attorney, uh, Passamaquoddy attorney Corey Hinton says, um, for us to be able to re reacquire the lands that our ancestors dwelled on, our ancestors relied upon and coexisted with, that helped our ancestors form the cultural identity that we rely on today is significant. We cannot understate the importance of returning the people uh, to the land. And, and I like to, some, some of my talks, I um, put up a tweet by a young indigenous activist that says, the land wants us back too. Um, probably should have put that. It seems like a significant thing. Anyway, that, that, that idea of the agency of the land and the people together is, is really obviously a key part of Wabanaki worldview. I strongly encourage you to visit the Sunlight Media Collective um, site and, and look at the video uh, of the return of Pine Island. It's really special. Dwayne Toma is up in a plane going, I mean, it's really, and he's singing and he's, it's, it's just, it's really special. And you get like, why, why are we so, <laughs> you know, why is this so important to us? And you get that through uh, Dwayne's vision. Um, so the realities, and, and this is a part of the work that Carol and others have helped us with, um, the realities of forming a commission like this and meeting the demands and returning land poses all sorts of interesting dilemmas. Um, some of them are just, you know, like turning on the right button for the sound, <laughs> but some of them are, are embedded in terms of the property systems that sort of still dictate how land trusts and conservation groups um, do their work. Uh, and, um, what, what that means for us as Wabanaki people engaging in that process. So some of the, some of this is about just getting the right time and staff, getting a, a real community driven process um, in terms of priority land identification. I think we're, we're working that out. I think once Elliottsville, that, that, that donation was made, Pine Island was made, there was a lot of things that came forward as possibilities, you know, and some of this, and 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 for first light learning journey, and and this is uh, you know, the this is something that a lot of allies with indigenous people um, formulate is that progress is, is made at at the the speed of trust, you know, in terms of how do we 
solve these issues and, and really speak to um, these significant opportunities, but to not do it in a way that um, violates any of the kind of uh, notions of ethical responsibility we as Wabanaki people have to these places. Um, and, and for that, that's a lot of internal work for us as Wabanaki people, sort of um, respecting and, and formulating our own ability to self-govern and manage our manage resources and be responsible for them um, across um, and in collaboration with each other. So this is just, you know, one of the one of the frameworks of uh, I just love the current scholarship on this is just so exciting to me because it's it's actually trying to say this is how a land trust or a conservation group can do their work. Um, what are the best practices? And this informs the work of First Light and their, they meet these benchmarks every time. Um, not every group, not in, not in every way, but as you can see, these best practices um, are significant investments in relationship building with indigenous people. Um, obviously engagement and partnerships, mandating them and the way your organization works is critical. Um, uh, applying and, and understanding indigenous knowledge systems, working on legislation to protect and expand indigenous lands and territories and sovereignty. And again, they've met that challenge in, in a significant way in recent, I won't, unless people, someone asked me about sort of recent legislation around that, I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, improve the protection of indigenous knowledge. Some things we mobilize as indigenous people are meant to be shared some not so much, and sort of how our partners understand that and work with us is really important. Um, link indigenous land and territories to conservation and biodiversity policy and program design. That's 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 really difficult. Um, again, knowledge systems coming from different uh, sets of values and, and frameworks, um, including um, program and policy indicators uh, to protecting and expanding indigenous governance, leadership, knowledge, territory expansion, reclamation. You know, if you're if you're measuring your success as a land trust or a conservation organization, you know, and you want to really make a difference, make these that as an indicator of your success, the return of land to indigenous people. Um, obviously empowering decision making, um, creating advisory committees, and embedding indigenous representation in organizational decision-making. All of these are really um, things that are happening already. So as I conclude, I don't know how, how far into time I went. Maybe I did it really quickly. No, um, about at time. I think I think about half an hour, a little longer. Um, to me, this work about land return, land access, Wabanaki um, leadership in this work across the state of Maine um, is probably the most important work I could possibly do. It's hard work. It's about the future of our planet. I actually think indigenous people and indigenous leadership um, is critical to the future of humanity on our planet. I don't know, maybe you guys agree or disagree with that. Um, but I think that that's, that's what's moving me to do it. The challenges are, are many. Um, there's ongoing legacies and colonial structures. Um, again, I mentioned this, I didn't go into, the, the, into it so deeply, but conservation easements re, you know, uh, require ongoing assessment um, and especially assessment of what they would call sort of people going in and taking things from them. So they have to make sure to, as if they're gonna protect that easement, that conservation easement, that there is no harm in, uh, created by anyone, including indigenous people accessing and taking things from it. Um, one thing that we found really early on was that they're like, oh, we trust you and you can go in and harvest brown ash or, or whatever. Um, we think we can include that in our management plans as, as a kind of sustainable practice, but we're going to be out there observing what you do. You know, that's all we need more. See, that's, I'm an anthropologist. That's what anthropologists do. You know, like that idea does not move at the speed of trust, right? That miss, that is saying we don't trust you as indigenous people. 
there's a whole host of work that um, we are tasked to do as indigenous scholars to kind of prove that these uh, our systems are sustainable. Obviously, land back and rematriation, these this work, um, they need each other, that there's a sort of more political and purposeful kind of transformational of the colonial structures work for land back, but that is almost meaningless without rematriation work, without the cultural work and, and the relationship and making those relationships right. And then I guess for me, I ask, ask yourself, or I ask myself, what are the opportunities, barriers in your various institutions to advance relationship with tribal nations, right? How do you spend time? How do you build relationships? How do you listen, learn, act? Any of that is really, really critical to our future together. So thank you so much. I have about 15 minutes or so for questions, if you want to take questions. If you don't mind receiving it for the recording. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. That's getting dry out there. All right, questions. I know there's a lot of good ones, right? Yeah. About, uh, it seems that in Somerset County, Sugarloaf, care about the Valley area, that there's a lot of extensive logging going on in the um, areas that appear to be owned by the native indigenous people. And I'm just questioning, is that something oh. that is uh, that you're aware of? Or um, I think up there are very sensitive about that sort of thing. So the question is, um, there are Penobscot and Passamaquoddy tribal lands in the Carabas Carabasset Valley region. And um, I've, I've never heard this actually before, that people think that there's, there's intensive logging and harvesting going on there. It's interesting because you can see there are boundaries. And there are boundaries. And I've seen, and I actually been up there recently, more on the Rangeley side of that. Um, Sure. No, I know what you're saying. It would be surprising, partly because on the Passamaquoddy lands there, they're very limited in their harvesting because they're participating in the carbon credit program in California. Um, and then I know pretty well the Penobscot harvesting. <laughs> I hear about it every time on the tribal council side. Almost all of our harvesting is selective harvesting. So it'd be interesting. You know, when you down to the of course, yeah. Well, I am interested in this notion that there. I know people who live here. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure they, I'm sure they notice it, it. I'd be surprised if it was tribal. I, again, because just because of the, I know the Penobscot harvesting and then the Passamaquoddies are not going to harvest to forfeit all the money they're getting from those credits. So, especially the, well, anyway, yeah. I, I, I would love to think about that. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to, and, and I wonder too, like, you know, I, I there are parts of Maine, you know, and, and you know that, that there is the notion of you know native people having all these benefits and all the and I, yeah. But I just it just if you look at the Google Maps, it just seems like this the boundary is very clear that certain hmm. areas and the roads up through there and all that. Sure. Well, I, I will say I, I will say one thing is that um, the lands that were reacquired. So we're talking about lands um, reacquired in the aftermath of the Settlement Act of 1980. So, so, oh, so you're saying like, yeah. All right. I mean, I'm just curious. I'm curious too. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Other other questions? Yeah. Back there, yeah.
Oh. Oh, turn off the lights and see the map. Sure. Oh. Maps. Maps. Okay. So here is map of lands taken by illegal trees after 1790. Um, this is the land. This is a map of conserved and parklands in Maine. It's still that it's not a great slide. Sorry, this one. I apologize. It's probably I can have the Turner network maybe colorize this. Yeah. So the these are the maps. Oh, oh, are you looking uh, also? Yeah, territorial map. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So yeah, here's here's the tribal like the seats of government, um, tribal location. I'm going to do a quiz um, at the reception and ask you where to put the tribes on a map. Yeah, question back there. Okay, let me try to capture this question. <laughs> is there a relationship between the large, especially the large landowning industries um, and their maybe overuse of lands and then communication or, or some sort of engagement with tribal managers and, 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 and nations? Um, there's, it's not as, vacant as you would think and actually i mean it's not great um and one of the one of the interesting yeah so i told i, would, I wouldn't speak about this so one of the things that i think motivated governor mills and, and our attorney general to not support the ld 1626 which was the support of tribal sovereignty um i think was them responding to some of those industries that were worried that there would be a, a tribal regulatory infrastructure that they may or may not have to deal with, um, even though they're not operating on tribal lands. I think I think that's a little bit of a red herring. I think it was misrepresented by that side, but what do I know? I'm just a biased Penobscot scholar. Um, but I think this idea that a tribal regulatory infrastructure in some ways would influence you know the way that other people not on tribal lands it, it, it is a possibility it, it has a possibility of impacting it it doesn't doesn't necessarily impact it. it involves all sorts of federal and other kinds of issues with it um but i do think you know we don't i think um I think the coalitions that have formed and that really supported tribal sovereignty um, are supportive by and large of protecting main lands. So I, so I didn't, I, I see that as sort of the politics of it was, was the politics that sort of dictates where we are in Maine with sort of how to collectively manage our lands and make the best use of them for future generations. Um, so I think, you know, in that political sense, there is a there is a back and forth, 
um, it, it tends to be more agonistic, um, you know, competitive in, in that way, in terms of getting the attention of, you know, a governor or an attorney general. But I do think that um, by and large, you know, for good or bad, right, the, har the amount of harvesting of trees, for example, in our state is nothing like it used to be, right, I mean, for a variety of reasons. And that's probably a good thing. Um, I think there are, and I was mentioning this earlier to our, <laughs> to our benefactors here, um, there are large landholders in the state of Maine, the biggest of which is, everyone know, the biggest landholder in Maine. Irving, yeah, so they own over a million acres. So I just filled out, they, I just gave them a bunch of money, filled up my car. Um, they, they own over a million acres of land. They're an energy corporation, right? They're, they're owning it as an investment and there's all sorts of interesting investments going on. I don't know, like um, I've been talking to some foresters recently that land is changing hands large tracts of land is changing hands quite a bit right now. And maybe some of you who have more money than I do um, know that land is actually when, when inflation is, is, is high, is actually a pretty good investment. It usually keeps pace with inflation. Uh, this is um, my business class that you should all your investments. So invest in land. Anyway, there's this old European notion that investing in land is uh, especially in times of high inflation is a good is a good bet. Anyway, um, so there are some interesting land deals happening broadly. This has actually created some of the opportunities that the First Light and the Wabanaki uh, Commission are seeing because people are recognizing an opportunity to sell those who want to sell, and sometimes we're able to enter into those market discussions. So this has actually been sort of beneficial, even though the the, the the cost of land has gone has gone up in Maine. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but the idea is that there are good there are good actors investing in land in Maine, people with track records that are positive generally, and there are more dubious ones that don't have a good track record of managing lands in any sustainable fashion, and they read the political leaves and say, you know, with the previous governor in that administration. You know the pressure for mining and other things, right? That that was you know an opportunistic play by large landowners and specific specific ones. I'm not going to name them, but you guys are you guys are all you're a crazy leftist. You know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, I think that that's we live in a that sort of dynamic time, and I think what I want to say is to to answer your question. There is an interesting dialogue that is happening now that hasn't been happening um, until the last few years. So that's that's and that's why it's a complicated <laughs> economic and political story. Yeah, I see here. Yeah. We had in power indigenous led decision making, and I'm curious about that because in order to accomplish what you want to accomplish. What are you doing to empower? It's almost like political training to help um, people work through the process. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. to, to get your committees to accomplish the kind of things you want to accomplish. So, do you have training programs? Um, what, what kind of things are you doing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, the question is in this section on sort of best practices, how does how does a conservation land trust group or, I don't know, a garden group I I empower in this indigenous led decision making? Um, a couple of things, and I'll just I'll just say like um, something that I I do as a as a researcher at, at the University of Maine. So, the University of Maine is a land grant institution. Comes with it a lot of good things, I think, and then some really bad things. Um, the idea that we want to have positive research relationships with tribal nations, one of the things that I tell my bosses, I have all sorts of bosses there, um, 
is if we want to do this work at scale and really want to make an impact, we need to make investments in an indigenous community based in research infrastructure, right? So that means some ability or some investment in indigenous communities uh, where researchers are, and, and I'm a part of the solution. I don't say like, you have to do this and you figure it out. I'm just an ideas person. Like I'm obviously doing this. We have a whole bunch of programs to, to do build this research infrastructure. And I would say with land trusts, that's part of what's happening now too, right? Which is some of it is, is just um, building up the relations and doing things like we, we do this, we've done it a couple times, land trusts 101. You know, the, the tribal world and the land trust world have not intersected in any positive ways up until these last few years. So I think there's this sort of training and exposure um, and that it's really a two-way street. You know, that, that um, one of the things that uh, has been aha moments in our relationships with people is that you know, they're like, oh, we want to hear from you, the Wabanaki people and your name. And we're like, okay, like, here we are. And then and we're all like, what do you do? And then we're like, oh, we're a land trust. Uh, what does that mean? And then, so it becomes one of these discussions that building the leadership, right, is about uh, transfer of, of, of tools and frameworks, um, but in in a collaborative manner, right? So I think, I think part of what, and I can share this. This is these are this is an Australian. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> this is all based on work in, with Aboriginal Australians, but I I really like this article. Um, that's part of what they're saying. Like, it, it's it's not enough to just invite someone to the table, or even sort of tell them what this table is about. It's about um, an ethical responsibility to making sure. People can participate and, and take leadership roles at this table that you have been kind of, you know, controlling for a few hundred years. So I think there's a whole set of training and ethical um, um, responsibility to this work. Uh, so it's sort of that, that way. I thought, I thought you're here. And then, yeah. Yeah, the advocacy or advocacy. <laughs> I've heard both. Um, yeah, I've heard both. And, and why is that not one of the um, major tribes now, or is that part of New Hampshire? I couldn't tell from the map. And the other question is how is Indigenous science transmitted from generation to generation, and is it recorded anywhere? Hmm. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I say Abenaki. I'm old school, but I think in Canada, uh, I think with a French accent, maybe you say Abenaki. I'm not sure. Um, the, the idea that, um, the location of, uh, of Abenaki people, actually there's, um, there is an, as a native led land trust called the Bombazine Land Trust that, um, is a critical kind of representation of people who are associated with, um, Abenaki tribal nations that are no longer here in Western Maine, um, but are descendants. So, you know, the classic one is the Norwich Walk site that was burned. And, you know, the English did horrible things. Um, but that those sites of, of, of destruction and sort of the attempts at reoccupation by um, Abenaki people and, and the descendants of the, those community members are in our communities, right? So there are various diasporas in our current tribes that represent you know, the descendants of folks like those at Norwich Walk. Um, they also went into um, southern Quebec for the Odenac um, tribes. And then there's this struggle to kind of identify or um, um, Abenaki uh, tribal communities in New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, the second question was, remind me. Oh, transmission. Yes, this is, I mean, we... One of the things that um, to understand a lot of indigenous knowledge frameworks is is like that, you know, people are familiar with this, that that knowledge is acquired by doing. But you can even think about this in a lot of like Wabanaki place names, right? So you know, we don't um, 
our languages are verb languages, right? They're, they're doing languages. English is a pretty strong noun object language. Um, so a lot of our place names are, you know, not like Joe Schmo's corner, but, you know, place where you gather herring, place where you fish by night, place, but, you know, so these are, the places are like the action. So similarly, in the epistemologies for a lot of indigenous people, the action and mowing and the responsibility are intertwined in the knowledge systems, right? So, you know, I think of, you know, the work of Suzanne Greenlaw, who's a Maliseet, she's my graduate student at the University of Maine. She does amazing work. Um, you know, our teachings, and she's doing work on sweetgrass and, and, and brown ash, and, you know, her work on sweetgrass is, our teachings are, you know, we are responsible for it and it needs us, but we need it. So, so the relationship is uh, what that means in terms of a practice and knowing sweetgrass is that if you pick it the right way and you pick it our, our way, it comes back more the next year. So that's stewardship and it's stewardship of direct knowledge and action, but it also represents this knowledge. So I think so much of our knowledge, the fact that we have, you know, our knowledge systems at all intact with the forced <laughs> beating it out of us in terms of our language and thing is, is because of the practices. Um, and I think that's where the knowledge has been, you know, handed on in practices, in the action, but the responsibility to the action and the thing that's intertwined there. So I think, yeah, it's oral and it's community driven and there are certain yeah, you know, knowledges that are passed in certain families, certain, you know, there's there's a diversification that goes on there as well. And um too, but but I think that's the general concept. Just maybe one more question. One more question. Saw you over there. Someone who works here. Yeah. Yeah, so our work on the animal dashboard, you know, it's interesting is my, um, I was the, the leader of this research group for until 2018. Um, my colleague, uh, John Daigle, who's also a Penobscot scholar, and he's in the um, forestry school at the University of Maine. He is, he is now the leader of that group, uh, which is not, I'm not, I'm going to answer your question. I'm just, I just want to make sure everyone understands that he is, uh, and, you know, what's interesting is that he, he was doing the work related to climate change adaptation. Um, and I was just participating in that. And now I'm directing that work. I think it's good to have a colleague where you can kind of shift responsibilities with. Anyway, that's just my aside. The, so the Emerald Ashbor work, um, for us, it was to do a bunch of different things. One of, one of them was, and this speaks to your, to your, um, question about how do we preserve knowledge? So a worry in the medium term is, I don't think our basket making, like let's, you know, we can imagine a landscape where there are no more ash trees in Maine, or there are very few. Um, I don't think our weaving traditions disappear there. I think there's other materials. I think there's a bunch of different options there. The knowledge that is really threatened in that context is how do we gather and what mechanisms and insights do we mobilize to identify basket quality ash trees? Where do we go? What's the assessment from a Wabanaki perspective around that? And so one of the outputs of that was to do pretty significant recordings um, in partnership with the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance to kind of make sure that that tradition is secure. And that, and that work is ongoing. Um, another part of that work is uh, seed collection. So again, planning for the worst, where is that? <laughs> Collecting the seeds, getting enough genetic diversity to replant. Um, but I think even more significantly in terms of Wabanaki leadership and decision-making, the work led to and, and part of it is research that was, hey, how are tribes included in invasive species management 
across the country. Turns out not, not very well. Uh, and, and, uh, and especially if something is already detected in a place, and this is where we had an advantage being far away from initial outbreaks, is we saw in Minnesota and uh, some tribal inclusion there, and they started working with tribes before they, they discovered it. And so we, so this is about how we did our work was to network and just be like, how do we do this in a way that includes Wabanaki people in some level of decision-making around it? Now, a couple of things with Emerald Ash 4. As of over a year ago, it's no longer federally regulated. Um, invasive. That means not as much funding, not as much attention. The state of Maine, I want to I want to think partly because of our work, but maybe just because people in Maine are awesome, um, has continued to regulate as if it were um, in a fed, federally regulated pest. It's a state regulated pest. Um, so that mobilizes certain kinds of frameworks around, you know, quarantines, Hey, now we're all experts on quarantines because of COVID. So the way the quarantine system works is in infected areas, people are not allowed to take ash out of those areas because the presumption is that they're infected with EAB, so they don't spread it around. So that that led to a framework of when uh, when two things that are part of these major agreements between the tribes, the federal government, and then to a lesser extent, actually the state, the state government, but they've taken this on, is uh, including Wabanaki basket makers and harvesters in the studies to, to figure out where EAB is in a particular place. And this has impacted not so much down here in Southern Maine, where there's a bunch of outbreaks, but has really impacted the way we've done the work in Northern Maine. Um, and then, include Wabanaki basket makers in the decision framework where quarantines are set. So if people know folks like Eldon Hanning or Richard Silboy, these are Micmac basket makers. One of the things that we wanted to make sure was, if at all possible, not make it so we set a quarantine in a way where where they harvest is behind a quarantine line, and where they process the wood is outside of that quarantine line because that would basically destroy their ability to practice their tradition. So, you know, that's where that work is. And it's been really amazing to see, like, because we planned so far ahead and kind of got everyone on board. And, and I, I gave a TED talk about this work. So, oh, definitely look that up um, about sort of how we solve wicked problems like that in an indigenous see wicked problems. No, that's my key framework. So, Daniel, did you have something? No. Oh, no, I just saw a hand over here. That's the last question, I think, is what you're saying. Yeah, there, yeah we'll pause there. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. thank you all. Thank you for bearing with us with a few technological difficulties. So, I want to invite you all to grab something out in the lobby and find a spot outside and. Uh, sit with us for a little bit and enjoy the afternoon.